You know, when I look at the early church in the book of Acts, I see there was an awakened church and I see there was an unstoppable church. I think one of the major reasons for this is that it was a church that was focusing on prayer. And a, a church that prays really is an awakened church. It really is an unstoppable church. A church that is uh, unstoppable uh, isn't based on how good the worship band is or how good the, the preacher is or how good the coffee is. Do you know, I, I think an unstoppable church and the power of an unstoppable church is rooted in prayer. And we're currently working on what it looks like to reopen as a church in terms of our building. And I think um, as, we, as we process this and journey through this, it's staggering the opening, is, is that one of the first things that we will be able to do together is to, is to pray, is to gather safely, uh, is to pray. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing. In fact, I think it's an amazing thing. That we're almost we're getting back to basics. We're getting back to um, what does it mean to be the church, like the early church? What is truly important? Uh, imagine it. Imagine just a few of us, if that's 20 or 30 or 40 of us, safely gathering just to pray, just to pray, just to get on our knees and cry out to God. I think that, that begins to be one of the, the major uh, hallmarks of a church that is, that is hungry and thirsty for a move of God. Uh, there are many things that we can't do, but that's actually helping us in that restriction to focus on what we can do. And I don't think there's anything more important that we can do as a church community to pray. And so when we begin to announce things um, over the next weeks and months, can I encourage you to get involved, to get engaged? We've seen an explosion of prayer online during the last few months. And I'd love for that to continue uh, when we do things online, yes, but also do things in person. That we really lean in and cry out to God in prayer. The Waken Church is a praying church. And if we want to be prepared truly for all that God has for us in this season, then we need to embrace a posture of prayer. Right from the outset in the, in the book of Acts, we see that the 120 were joined together, Acts 1.14, constantly in prayer. They were joined together constantly in prayer. So they were together in the sense that they were just together, but they were also together in the, in the sense of their, the commonality of their vision and their heart and their focus of what they were praying for. And they joined constantly, which is they were busy and they were persistent in prayer. And then the Spirit comes. And then we see in Acts 2, verse 42 to 47, really the, the DNA, the culture of the early church. What were those values, those expressions of the Christian faith that were most important? And one of those is that they devoted themselves to prayer. You know, uh, for me, and I'm sure for you, just hearing incredible stories around our church community, is that this has been a wonderful season, a wonderful opportunity to lean into prayer as individuals, as, uh, as families, as, as groups online, um, in our homes. And, and we've seen an explosion of prayer happen in the culture of our church. Uh, and and the, la the language of prayer, interestingly, has re even re-entered into kind of the public square with, with many commenting on the subject uh, of prayer and many searching about prayer online. Uh, Russell Brand, for instance, he recently commented that now everyone is looking for a sacred experience. Friends, even when we, we can't meet like normal, we can pray. And as we see in the early church, it was, it was a normative Christian experience. It was, it was nothing extraordinary, the results were, but actually it was all part and parcel of being an ordinary, normal Christian. And so should it be for us today. And God is, is wanting to stir and awaken his people. So we, we have a choice. Do we sleep through this season? Or are we awakened to prayer and intercession? I just want to focus for a moment on intercession because you may have heard about intercessory prayer, praying on behalf of others. Uh, intercession for, for many years has been seen as kind of like the the, the Navy SEALs group of the church or the SES group of the church. And um, 
It is for every single follower of Christ, not just for the special few, but for every single person who's called to prayer and intercession. Friends, it is impossible. It is impossible to see a move of God, to see breakthrough, to see change, awakening, authority, power, fulfillment of the call of God on our lives as individuals and as a church without radical engagement in a posture and place of prayer and intercession. It's one of the most important things that we can do. And it's time for us to discover, if you already haven't in the last few months, our voices and our knees and engage in intercessory prayer. Intercession was something that God began to speak to me about really uh, when I was about aged 18. And it was in that place of prayer where I began to steward my intimacy with God for the sake of others. Uh, invariably, this, this would happen behind closed doors, um, often on, on my knees, because that really is the posture of humility. We see that in the Bible, uh, often accompanied with fasting. Again, expression of just um, humbling myself. And it's there we begin to enter into that place of prayer with God. It's almost like a, a wrestling. Um, we begin to identify with his heart. What is on God's heart? Lord, show me the things that break your heart and, and lay that burden, if you like, on me, on my heart. And in that place of, of prayer and intercession, there's like an agony. As, we, as your eyes begin to see really uh, the desperation, the brokenness, the state of the world. But, but out of that identification and agony uh, often comes then a birthing and a breakthrough. The, the public victories that we see, if you like, are really done in the place of the, the prayer closet. Something has broken, a, a victory has been won, and we begin to see a breakout of activity, of kingdom activity, answered prayer, coincidences begin to happen, a, a real love for people, uh, an authority over, over sickness and the demonic, there's kind of a weight on one's words. Uh, and yes, there's an increase certainly on, on pressure and, and persecution, but ultimately you trade all of that in because you get an intimacy with God, which is so, so precious. And, and in that there's a cost to it, there's a sacrifice to it. You know, when we ask for more, of God, it always comes with a price tag. Are we willing? Are we willing to really surrender and lay down with everything in our lives for the sake of God, the gift of God himself, of intimacy with him and his cause? We see in the book of Acts, all throughout the pages, prayer, 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 prayer. Common purposes for miraculous purposes, so many different things. We see uh, Peter raising Dorcas, um, is that he knelt down and prayed. When Paul healed uh, Publius, his sick father, he prayed and laid his hands on him. After Peter and John were arrested and released, they prayed for boldness. In Acts chapter four, when Peter was arrested again, the church offered constant prayer. When a replacement uh, was chosen for Judas, they prayed about it. We see that in Acts 1 verse 24, when the seven were appointed in Jerusalem to care for the widows, they prayed about it. Acts chapter 6, when the church in Antioch first sent out Paul and Barnabas to preach, they prayed about it. Acts 13, when Paul and Barnabas pointed elders in the churches they planted, they prayed about it. Acts 14, this is a pattern. It's just a way of life. It's just the early church was just... Um, soaked in prayer. There's personal prayer. Peter was, was in prayer when the, the vision concerning Cornelius was revealed to him. Paul and Silas were praying while in the heart of a, of a jail. Paul was in the temple praying when the Lord warned him of the danger he would face. Now how this begins is really in that place of hungering and thirsting after God. St. Augustine said this, you have put salt in our mouths that we may thirst for you. You know what, the, the distractions of life don't cut it, the, the busyness of life doesn't cut it. But a life of intimacy in prayer is the key to human flourishing. I believe that every life change for you and I, I believe that every uh, great decision, 
every bit of wisdom that we need, uh, creativity, peace, joy, kingdom influence, power, is all at the other end of prayer. I wonder how many of you today can almost taste uh, that salt in your mouth, that desire for more, that longing, that aching. There's, there's an angst, there's a burden that won't leave you. And you'd be like, what is going on right now? Actually, it's God calling. He's knocking on the door of your heart to come to a place of intimacy with him in prayer. There is great power in prayer. I really believe that the expansiveness of God's purpose is only seen through our inclusiveness of him. When we begin to include God in everything in that place of prayer, we begin to see the ex expansiveness of his purpose. Tim Keller wrote this, prayer is the only entryway into genuine self-knowledge. It is also the main way we experience deep change, the reordering of our loves. Prayer is how God gives us so many of the unimaginable things he has for us. Indeed, prayer makes it safe for God to give us many of the things that we most desire. It is the way we know God, the way we finally treat God as God. Prayer is simply the key to everything we need to do and be in life. We must learn to pray. We have to. When, it, when a student asked, what is there left in the world for original dissertation research? Albert Einstein replied, find out about prayer. Somebody must find out about prayer. Now we see, and we looked a little bit at this last week in Acts chapter 4, a great example of prayer. Persecution was there. And when we begin to see an incredible prayer by, uh, by Paul, and what's interesting is that he begins with the sovereignty of God. In this prayer, he begins in Acts chapter 4, O sovereign Lord. So when the rulers and the leaders of the day and those in authority are coming against them, is that they pray for boldness, but they focus their eyes and their gaze and attention on who God is. Not a change in circumstances, not Lord, deal with them or smite them or, or whatever, but Lord, I look to you as the one true sovereign Lord and ruler. He's in charge, he's in control. They, they try and, they're trying to shut these guys up and yet in their prayer, they're saying, ultimately, we are under the authority of God. There is a higher authority than the edicts of men and they cannot overturn the decrees of God. So they fill their minds. This is really powerful as we engage in prayer, in faith, particularly in a, in a season that we're in, is that we use this as kind of a pattern, as a template, is that we begin to fill our minds with divine sovereignty with his divine sovereignty that he is the God of creation he made the heavens and the earth he's a God of revelation he's the God of history and, and you see in summary you see those words in in, in those few verses uh, the verbs you made and you spoke and you decided it's all about raising expectations like like the great prayers of the Bible they fill their prayers about God it's about a vision of God when we, when we see God and we see how, how far we, we, we can go, then it calls on us then to respond and say, Lord, our Lord, I will go for you. But we need to have vision to see what God is doing. It's interesting in this 138 word prayer, they spend 103 words with words about God and 35 words asking God to do it. Three quarters declaration and worship, stirring and building faith. They're contextualizing, as it were, their own crisis, their situation in God's story. How many of you right now are going through something? There's a narrative, there's a story in your life. I, I want to encourage you in the place of prayer and faith, as you begin to read God's word and begin to pray and declare how good and sovereign God is and how much he's in control, as you begin to frame your situation in God's story. He's working things out together for good. He's working it out. Trust in him. Look to God, not the problem. Don't magnify the problem. That's why prayer is so, so important. You know, when it comes to prayer, a number of us have different anxieties. We may have outcome anxiety, 
hey, what if, what if this prayer doesn't work? Uh, we may have motive anxiety. Look, I, I try and pray and I simply can't concentrate. Um, maybe I'm not the best candidate that God's going to use to uh, bend and shape history. And then we have God anxiety. We may look at the various things that are happening in terms of uncertainty and suffering and injustice right now. We look at all the opinions out there that we read on the news and social media. It's like, which God am I praying to? What we're going to do is just pray through that anxiety. Pray through that anxiety. Let me encourage you to do a few basic things. First of all, just pray what you've got. Hey, you don't feel good. Life's not good. You're struggling with an addiction. You're hurting, you're disappointed. Things aren't turning out how you wanted them to. You're facing something difficult. Turn to God. Pray what you've got. Just go for it. Whatever's on your heart, just begin to express your heart to God. Be vulnerable. That's okay. It's not about being perfect in prayer. It's about making a start. Just pray what you've got and pray where you are. Pray where you are. I can't wait for us to, uh, to, to gather. I want to encourage you to, to pray and, and, and lock your, your bedroom door and just get on your knees. I've encouraged that today. But hey, turn. Where, where, wherever you are, turn your place and your posture into an altar of prayer. Richard Foster says this, he invites us into the living room of his heart where we can put on old slippers and share freely. He invites us into the kitchen of his friendship where chatter and batter mix in good fun. He, he invites us into the dining room of his strength where we can feast to our heart's delight. He invites us into the study of his wisdom where we can learn and grow and stretch and all the questions we want. He invites us into the workshop of his creativity where we can be co-laborers with him working together to determine the outcomes of events. He invites us into the bedroom of his rest, where new peace is found and where we can be naked and vulnerable and free. It is also the place of deepest intimacy where we know and are known to the fullest. That's what prayer is. Thomas Keating said this, perfect prayer is to not know you are praying. Perfect prayer is to not know you are praying. And so just, just let it flow. Just be conversing with God, taking time out with God. But let's really begin to, to centre our lives and our church community on the importance of prayer. You know, for me, um, I really, really want to see a move of God in our midst. I'm so thankful for all the amazing things we're seeing, so thankful for the amazing stories that I'm hearing we're entering into uh, just an incredible, fruitful time. But I really want to see a move of God where the church is awakened and our community is transformed. But I know that there's no shortcut to that. I know there's many things that we can do to contribute to making that happen in terms of being bold, in terms of being spirit-filled, uh, all the things that we're talking about, being inclusive. But prayer, it must begin and um, it must be centred on prayer. And so in, invite the Lord. If you don't have that thirst, if you don't have that hunger, invite the Lord to give you that. And let's begin to press in to see a move of God in prayer in our church. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.